Okay, then I can carry on. Um, enabling them to institutionalize the pattern of racial inequality and social segregation which already existed in South Africa, which already existed in South Africa. Apartheid gave the force of law to racial categorization, residential and recreation segregation, and placed obstacles in the way of freedom of movement and freedom of association, making it very difficult to operate across the color line, especially for civil society organizations, sports organizations, and so on. So in terms of sport and politics, while segregation and inequality in sport became entrenched, the ethnic sectarianism, which still existed in some black sports clubs in Cape Town, finally broke down during the 1950s. And those soccer clubs, which still had discriminatory clauses against Africans and Muslims, lifted them by 1961. Leisure mountaineering among black communities in Cape Town. Mountain-based leisure pursuits among black, predominantly colored communities in Cape Town during the post-World War II decades became more popular. The question that needs to be asked is why? While proximity to the mountain was an important factor, there were two other main reasons for this. The first was the increase in the number of colored high schools during this period, such as Harold Cressy High School in Cape Town in 1951. This is a picture of Harold Cressy High, and you can see how close they, they were and remain to the mountain. And it was at these schools where many young people were first introduced to the mountain by their teachers, who took them on mountain hikes. These teachers included Erwin Combrink, at Livingston High in Claremont, as well as Science Master and CPMC member Lionel van der Horst at Harold Cressy. Mountain hiking traditions were established at these and many other high schools in Cape Town, such as Trafalgar and Oakland's High School. The second reason for the popularity of the mountain chain as a recreation area lay in the fact that it offered an escape from the inequalities and the discrimination of apartheid. So despite the fact that the 1950s to the 60s was a period when the restrictions of apartheid were reaching their zenith, the Table Mountain chain remained free of these restrictions, thus offering a rare respite from the ugly reality in the world below. These are some extracts, some quotations from uh, former District 6 residents like Joe Schaffers, who still works at the District 6 Museum, very interesting person. Linda Fortune was a former um, head of the District 6 Museum. Um, Stephen Joy was a former um, scholar at, the Living at Livingston High School. Now, all the communities living in close proximity to the Table Mountain chain, such as the Boer Cup, Protea Village, Cork Bay, Simonstown, all of these continued to nurture the next generation of nature lovers and mountain walkers, as young people enjoyed their leisure hours on the mountain. But it was District 6 in particular which grew the pool of black mountaineering enthusiasts through the work of organizations such as the Silver Tree Boys Club and the various scout troops which regularly took youths up Table Mountain. David McAdam, who was a warden at the Silver Tree Boys Club and an MCSA member, was especially instrumental in sparking a passion for mountaineering uh, among District 6 groups. Then two groups of young boys and adolescents from District 6 also often camped in the caves of Table Mountain over weekends school and public holidays, especially the East, um, Easter period, as it was a cheap and convenient way for them to enjoy themselves. And if you go to the District 6 Museum, you'll see some of these very joyous pictures <coughs> of scouts and other, other groups. The picture that I have here is of um, a group of people at uh, the Protea village. 
um, and that is the Good Shepherd, Church of the Good Shepherd. Um, and the interesting thing about the Protea village, which is just be, which was just below Kirstenbosch, is that it was like a like a rural, like a country village, you know, no electricity, no running water, and the people um, engaged with each other very closely, very intimately, and had a very close and familiar connection with the Table Mountain chain. <coughs> The Cape Province Mountain Club, let's continue their story. A new generation of climbers joined the club, such as Sydney Alexander. This is a picture of Sydney. He is still a member of the CPMC and the oldest member of the club. The club had a number of top climbers, including Charlie Hankey, who formed a climbing partnership with MCSA member Barry Fletcher, opening a number of routes on Table Mountain. This was not uh, this was not publicized given the MCSA ban on uh, the members climbing with so-called non-Europeans. The club's first expedition abroad was that taken to Kilimanjaro. It was also heavily involved in search and rescue activities and formed strong links with foreign clubs such as the Japanese Alpine Club. They came through Cape Town in 1957 with the Japanese Antarctic uh, expedition. Mountaineering was very much a family activity, with some prominent families being the Brocks, the Februaries, the Gangats, and the Knight families. And some leading members of the club included George Gangat, who opened several routes on Table Mountain, so he was an expert mountain climber and Patrick Pasquale, who is in the, on the extreme right over there. He's with us today. He was also a, a member <coughs> of the club at the time and edited the newsletter, Mountain Lookout. <clears throat> Racial prejudice and discrimination worsened during the apartheid era, making it difficult for the club members to cross um, farm areas and to reach the, um, the mountains in the rural areas. In 66, District 6 was declared a white group area, leading to the destruction of, of the district from the late 1960s onwards. <clears throat> this was a serious blow to the club. Not only did it le lose its meeting venues, but it lost the advantage of proximity to Table Mountain. The recruitment base for the club remained family and friends, but there were also class and financial factors at play. And the club started diversifying, with Muslims now joining the club, Ishmat Ali being one of the first Muslim members. But Africans still did not join. And I think the reasons of, for, these, for this was very much to do with the rigidity of the apartheid era. Also, the cost of transport and equipment, distance that Africans had to travel to the mountain. Then we move on to the Western Province Mountain Club. This was established in Athlone on the Cape Flats by former CPMC member Eric Carolus in 1967. And many of the club's early members lived in Athlone and in surrounding suburbs. They were also granted a hut on Table Mountain with the support, support of uh, Mr. Doman on the, on the city council. And they were only granted a hut on condition that the club stated in its constitution that it was a colored club. So it just gives you an, an inkling of the rigidity of the um, apartheid era at the time and how difficult it was. Um, some of the members had their interest in mountaineering sparked by the experience in the scouts or at school. Um, I know that Stephen Fortain had his um, interest sparked at school. Stephen Fortain is also with us today. The Mountain Club <clears throat> continued to enjoy a favored position with government, continuing to accept its ideology, whether this was required by law or not. Um, as shown by its refusal to host the members of the Japanese Alpine Club or invite them on a climbing expedition. It was regarded at that time 
as a, as a non-white club. This was before the 60s when the Japanese were granted honorary white status. The MCSA also continued to assiduously court the government through its tradition of inviting senior leaders of the ruling party to serve as its patron. As a result, the club was generally regarded as an integral part of the so-called white establishment, and its members generally had no problem gaining the consent and cooperation of white farmers and state foresters alike. In the 1950s, the club continued to bar blacks from membership, but it went further than that. It also prohibited fraternizing of its members with black mountaineers. Whenever the club discovered any infraction of its unwritten rules, then that member was asked to resign. This hardline approach was uh, continued during the 1960s when Caspar Bloss, um, I, I assume he was a, a, a black mountaineer, um, he, an article featured in the Cape Times of the August, I forget which, and he took to task the MCA at the time. But the club's response was that we have never had a non-white member, we only admit whites. So that was its stance in the 60s. The UCT Mountain and Ski Club. By the 50s, the exclusion of blacks from, the student, from all student clubs was well established um, in a kind of gentleman's agreement. But this was challenged in 1954 by a colored student and keen mountaineer, Kenny Parker, who really set the cat among the pigeons when he applied for uh, membership at that time. Um, the club, as well as the university administration under J.P. Dumini at the time, uh, were absolutely not in favor. And it took five years um, when, Dumini, when um, Parker came back again as a, as, as a student member. Only at that time was he granted um, membership. But I think one also needs to put that into context because this was the height of apartheid and it took the MCSA another 30 years to, to grant access to their first black member. So this was the first instance of a white club in the apartheid era, in the deep apartheid era, grant, granting a black member access. So one just, I just needed to put that into context. But the problem of access in rural areas did not go away. And Parker himself took action um, by negotiating, successfully negotiating, with white farmers involved so that he could get access to the mountain areas concerned. Now, why did he do that? You know, this, this, this type of self-assurance and confidence was quite unusual for the 1950s. And I think the reason is because he was a mature student. He wasn't fresh out of high school. He was an aspiring writer. And at a time when most South Africans were forced to live in narrow, race-based worlds, he was mixing socially with a bohemian set of writers, poets, and art artists, including Richard Reeve and Peter Clark, who regularly met at, at the Greenpoint home of Afrikaans author and sister Jan Rabi and his wife, Marjorie Wallace, an artist. He was, uh, Rabi was also a very keen mountaineer, and there are um, references to Rabi and um, Parker and others on, on mountain trips as well at that time. Um, and as I mentioned yesterday, Reeve was a mountaineer, and it might interest you, you to know that Peter Clark was a, a, an, an, a very... Um, uh, enthusiastic mountaineer as well. He was born in Simonstown, and then during the uh, forced removals, he was removed to um, Ocean View, and he was um, fortunate enough to secure uh, a house which was, you know, very close to the mountain area. So he continued his mountaineering career at that time. So this uh, bunch of sisters, this bohemian crowd, flouted the. Um, the race-based world that they lived in at the time and went mountaineering together. Um, and that's something that I'd like to explore in the future. Despite opening to all students in 1959, this did not, open, this did not mean that the clubs 
membership changed. It remained predominantly and exclusively white. And I think this had a lot to do with the culture of the club at the time. And the fact that the club didn't seem to be concerned about the fact that if they did have um, colored members, um, they would not have been allowed um, at campsites at Algeria, for example, in, um, in the Cedarburg. They wouldn't have been allowed to go to the Drakensberg, etc. cetera. Um, another reason for the lack of diversity in the club's membership was that virtually all of the colored students who attended unity movement aligned high schools, um, which had a political tradition of non-racialism and non-collaboration, boycotted student clubs and activities. So there was a political reason why these students did not join student clubs like the UCT MSC. And this was despite the strong mountain hiking traditions of schools such as Livingston, Harold Cressy, and Trafalgar. This is a picture of Livingston High School. And although it was in Lower Claremont, very far from Upper Claremont, it did not stop Livingston High students from going mountaineering at weekends and public holidays. I was one of those mountaineers in the 60s. Right, on to the subject of women who continue to battle sexism in the 60s. Um, and and you, 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 this was embodied in 1961 when the secretary took the decision to put a popsy on the stand. And I presume the popsy means an attractive young female student in order to attract the attention of male students who were actually the club's main targets. The political context of the next era, which was the 70s and the 80s, and one of the defining moments of this era, as we will all recall, was the Soweto uprising in 76, which was obviously met with a, a violent response by the state. The same in the 1980s, when in fact it seemed as though the country was in the grip of an undeclared civil war. But at the same time, the state was pressured into making political concessions by a regime which was determined to survive. Sport and politics, two decades of residential and recreation apartheid confined black people to an inferior, unequal sporting and recreation environment. By the 70s, the ideal of non-racialism as espoused by the South African Council on Sport, SACOS, was becoming entrenched in the black sporting sector. And by the 80s, the SACOS position on non-racial sport was widely accepted in the black sporting sector. What was happening in the leisure mountaineering sector? Um, it was badly impacted by the forced removal of colored communities all the way around the mountain. And this, this con as, as I said, it started in the late 60s, but it really took off during the 1970s. And people were moved to purpose-built dormitory townships on the Cape Flats, located a considerable distance from the mountain, which now required expensive travel costs, which could be ill-afforded by poor communities. Um, another factor was a ban on camping on Table Mountain in the mid-70s due to the fire ha hazard, because this was unregulated camping. So you can understand why they did that. But the, the problem was the consequence of that, the removals and the camping, was to curb mountain-based leisure pursuits among the colored population from the late 70s onwards. So for many, it meant the loss of an intimate connection with, with the mountain. That regular interaction had established with the mountain and you know, people who are now traumatized by the eviction, um, they now became estranged from the mountain. Another interesting mountain club which was established in the early 1970s was the Bats Climbing Club. It was an informal mountain club and it was established by Dave Cheesmond who was a member of the MCSA. And he, together with several other mountaineers in Cape Town, 
established this non-racial group called the Bats Climbing Club, which included Ed February, whom we've met before as a CPMC member. It also included members from the WPMC, Western Province Mountain Club, as well as progressive mountaineers from the Mountain Club of South Africa. This is a picture of Dave Cheesemont in later years. The MCSA members in the BCC were called uh, to, to task by the MCSA and they were told to desist from mixed climbing, but they simply ignored this pressure. But there were hostile relations between the BCC and the MCSA. Um, especially after an article appeared in a British climbing magazine, I think it was called Mountain, in the mid-70s, quoting Dave Cheesemond, who was very critical of the conservative MCSA. The MCSA was so infuriated by Cheesemond that the Cape Town section decided to declare Cheesemond persona non grata in 1976. Oops. Um, the South African Climbers Club was another club which started in, the, in 1977. And um, there was some, many of the same individuals were involved in the formation of the SACC. And this too was formed as a counter to the MCSA and was a non-racial club. Now, remarkably for this time, the, um, the club received funding from the government. And I am surmising that the probable explanation for this is that the club's operations coincided with the anti sacos propaganda um, by white sports administrators and the government. So this is why they decided to um, sponsor the SACC and so that they could present a good image of the club, of the, of, of the sport rather, the sector to the international um, arena. Another new entrant on the scene was the University of the Western Cape Mountain Club. I'm still busy start, be doing my research on this particular club, but I have ascertained that it must have been established during the late 70s and arose from a hiking tradition. Um, and this club had also um, been nurtured by graduates of the Felton Flay Adventure School, um, which had earlier been established in 1963 as a physical, and edu physical education and outdoor program for colored youths under the auspices of the Colored Affairs Department. The club appeared to be quite successful. It was one of the most, uh, one of the biggest on campus at any rate, undertaking hiking trails and clothing trips all over the country. Although only a small number of the club, club's members actually um, participated in, in rock climbing. But unlike the UCT MSC, the club received absolutely no funding from the university administration, which obviously couldn't afford, afford it. So members had to pay for everything themselves. And in terms of the way they had to operate, they had to operate very similarly to the CPMC and the WPMC in terms of the way in which they had to operate during the apartheid era. The CPMC recruitment continued along similar lines as before, and the club was still unable to attract African members which may be attributed in large part to the rigid segregation of the apartheid era. As one CPMC member has noted, we hardly saw black people on the mountain except for workers. But by the 1980s, the situation had changed slightly. Colleen Knipp um, drove a very strong outreach program among youth and church groups on the Cape Flats, and this yielded some African members but only fleetingly, unfortunately. The club also continued to cope with the difficulties of operating in the apartheid era. Um, and there were a number of unpleasant encounters, including occasions when farmers even threatened club members with firearms. 
But for the most part, CPMC members just took these obstacles in their stride. Nobody thought the pilot was going to end in any case. So as Ed February said, that's how things were. We didn't think of them as challenges. We just dealt with them. During the 1970s, most of the remaining residents of District 6 were removed, resulting in the club going into a slow decline by the mid-80s, to the extent that by the late 80s, it was feared that the club might have to close. The WPMC operated in a similar way to the CPMC. Um, it espoused the same non-racial ideals, although it was forced by the council to operate as a, non, as, as a colored club. The club also had no African members and probably for similar reasons to the CPMC. The UCT MSC, the club's membership and um, mode of operation continued very much as before as a predominantly white club with a club culture that was unwelcoming to blacks. The fact that the UCT MSC's main climbing partners were either exclusively or predominantly white mountain clubs, such as the MCSA and the mountain clubs at Witz, this is the Witz Club, which was established in 1959, I see, um, Natal Peter Maritzburg, Stellenbosch, and the Pretoria Universities also contributed to this um, white club culture, as it would not have been possible to hold joint expeditions with an integrated club from UCT with politically inflexible tertiary institutions like Stellenbosch and Pretoria at that time. However, by the 80s, the club had completely changed. Its narrow membership base had now become more diverse as black students such as Ed February, Ed February seems to have joined every single club, um, as, as well as Richard Hess. Um, February was now able to gain extensive climbing experience during a number of climbing trips abroad. This is a picture of Ed February, I think in the Cedarburg. And the club with its access to UCT's financial resources was able to offer its talented black climbers opportunities to gain mountaineering expertise and experience abroad that the CPMC and the WPMC could not because of their meager resources and which the MCSA up until 1986 would not. <clears throat> By the 70s, the MCSA was still concerned to maintain its status as an exclusively white sports club by ensuring that, white, that black club members did not make use of its facilities. Nor by the late 70s was it ready to contemplate opening its membership to all. The issue of black membership was only tackled in 1984, and even then only in response to a request from a black member of the public. Even then, it took 20 months of consultations with farmers, forestry officials, club members, etc., to reach a decision. In September 1985, and despite the concerns of club members that any move towards open membership would result, would be the thin end of the wedge, which would result in the club being swamped by herds of non whites the club decided to open its membership to all. And then from the mid-1980s onwards, the MCSA embarked on a number of changes in its relationship with black mountaineers and clubs. The first black member joined in 86, nearly a century after it had first been established. Women and mountaineering in the 1970s. The focus of the MCSA still appeared to be on males, with recruitment and mountain leadership courses still being aimed at young boys. And so the club continued to foster a stereotypical masculine image of climbing. During the 1980s, the UCT MSC still had an offensively sexist approach to women 
in mountaineering, which probably had a lot to do with a macho and immature student culture prevailing, which persisted in viewing rock climbing as an exclusively male terrain. We move on now to the dawn of democracy to the present, 1990 to 2018. And as we all recall, this was a period of socio, economic, and political transition, which began with the unbanning of Nelson Mandela and ushered in the beginning of the democratic era, when the first democratic elections were held in April 94. While South Africa was set on a path of political renewal and constitutional democracy, since then the country has faced and continues to face numerous challenges to democracy up to the present time. The interaction among mountain clubs in the early 1990s reflected this new mood, this new political mood. And there was a period of friendly and close interaction among all the mountain clubs. MCSA, the CPMC, WPMC, UCTMSC, UWC, MC, and even the Stellenbosch Bergen Tour Club. So by the mid-1990s, the future for mountaineering looked promising, diverse, accessible, and broadly participatory. Looking then uh, more specifically at each mountain club, in the 90s, the CPMC collaborated in a strong outreach program with the school's environmental education program, SEEP, which offered various outdoor activities in protected areas. Um, but this required significant financial resources to fund the transport, the accommodation, and the accommodation needs of the participants, most of whom were from low-income communities. But funding started being withdrawn from 2010, which negatively impacted on the club's ability to participate in the program. And because the club does not have the resources or the volunteer base to have a sustainable outreach program of its own, that has come largely come to, to an end. <coughs> so for the past few years, the club seems to have concentrated mainly on mountain hiking rather than climbing. <coughs> the WPMC um, was going strong in the 90s, regular climbing meets, conservation program, newsletter, and so on. And the club celebrated its 50th anniversary in 2017. This is a picture from uh, one of the um, newspapers um, showing the 50th anniversary in 2017. But the club has to deal with many of the same problems, aging membership, few young members, slow recruitment, and just lack of sustainability, and a move towards mountain hiking instead of rock climbing. <clears throat> the MCSA in the 90s, they began discussions on amalgamation with the other clubs. Um, and these were taken quite seriously, but the CPMC and the WPMC feared the loss of the institutional culture, and they decided to remain separate. Um, but the discussions stirred up tensions in these two clubs. In 1993, the MCSA began considering how to address the elitist label, which was often attached to it. And it decided to launch an outreach committee to work with historically disadvantaged communities and to nurture a new generation of climbers and leaders for the MCSA in the future. This laid the basis for the MCSA's long-running outreach program, which is still in operation today. Then in 1994, the MCSA decided to, to contact environmental representatives from the ANC in order to establish the club as a major policymaker with the government in waiting. 
But the following year, when the club was contacted by the Democratic Party, as it was yeah, then known, the, um, the MCSA decided to reconsider its position. And it decided that the MCSA, MCSA cannot be seen to be supporting any one political party and that its responses would from then onwards be forwarded to all political parties. So, you know, this presented a, a very uh, pragmatic decision and a decisive break with, you know, from the way in which the club used to operate in the past. The Mountain Club concluded 1994, the year that democracy was finally embraced by South Africa with a very reflective editorial on its changing status. And then in 2005, the club apologized for its actions in using anti-Semitism, segregation, and apartheid as a bar to membership. Today, the MCSA remains South Africa's premier mountain club. But despite a long running and vigorous outreach and development program, aimed at the youth in disadvantaged communities, it is still a club with a predominantly white membership, as indeed is the case with many of South Africa's major environmental organizations, despite efforts by many organizations to diversify their membership. I think in what might be termed a full stomach phenomenon. This is a phenomenon which is not only limited to South Africa or South African civil society organizations, but can be found uh, to be the case globally. So there is perhaps an element of inevitability about the composition of the MCSA, because mountaineering is an expensive pursuit, largely restricted to the middle class, which in South Africa is still overwhelmingly white. In the 1990s, the UCT MSC also launched its own outreach program aimed at underprivileged scholars. And in 1992, in a reflection of the new political mood, the club took a decision to base its activities on non-racialism, non-sexism, and democracy. In 1993, the first joint meet was undertaken by the club, the University of the Western Cape Mountain Club, and Stellenbosch University's Berg and Tour Club. But you know, it was, it, it's telling that this only took place in 1993, when, as we have seen, UWC's Mountain Club had been, had been in existence since the 1970s. So it took UCT this long to invite UWC to a joint meet. Currently, the UCT MSC remains a predominantly white club, despite the fact that a number of white, the number of white students at UCT is steadily declining. Plans are therefore in place for 2019 to address this. The lack of representativity in the club is a bit of a puzzle, because even given the fact that not all black students are from a middle class background, it would nonetheless be expected that the recruitment of black students would be easier at a tertiary institution. That difficulties are still being experienced possibly speaks to the historical reasons that black families have been unable to engage positively with a national, with a natural environment, and thus unable to establish outdoor traditions in their communities and in their families. This brings me to my conclusion. This course has sought to show that since the first recorded instances of the non-subsistence use of the Table Mountain chain, the nature of leisure interaction with the mountain has been governed by the overlapping factors of race and class, white domination and black subordination. So it was only during the early years of the 20th century that black leisure use of the Table Mountain chain took root, and even that only among colored communities living in close com proximity to the, to the mountains. However, the forced removal of most of these communities to distant townships on the Cape Flats from the mid-60s onwards 
not only severely curtailed the participation of these communities in mountain-based recreation, but started a process of alienation from the mountain, which in many cases has been passed on to succeeding generations. It is this legacy from the past, i.e. a century of racialized and unequal power relations in the field of mountaineering, which has resulted in the sport being indelibly and negatively affected. However, this does not mean that we have to remain forever trapped in the negative legacy of the past. But it does mean that those of us who are involved in mountain-based activities or who just love mountains need to recognize and understand this legacy and acknowledge that the social political factors which so strongly influenced the history of mountaineering and of mountain clubs in Cape Town are still at play today. With this understanding, we can plan for the future. So where to from here? At this stage, there is probably too much historical water under the bridge for the goal of unity among local mountain clubs to be resuscitated. However, the need remains for a large, well-funded and sustainable program for the, aimed at the youth in low-income communities in order to grow a generation of mountain lovers. But not even the MCSA, which has sunk literally tens of thousands of rands, volunteer hours, leadership training, transport, and accommodation into the outreach program has succeeded in this aim, as the need is simply too great for one club. Is there then a role for government in the provision of such resources. Here again, the MCSA's experience is instructive. The club's effort to obtain sustainable funding from the Department of Sport and Recreation has been, have been fraught with difficulties, with amounts applied for having either not been granted in full or payment being delayed, thus negatively impacting on the club's ability to run its programs effectively or even sustainably. I mean, you can't have a, a program when you don't know whether your funding is going to come or whether it's not going to come or whether you're going to get all the funding. Um, so could national parks, for example, the, an, another uh, arm of government, could they step into the gap? Um, and the short answer is no. Sandparks has been operating a junior ranger program in the Table Mountain National Park since 2009, which gives year-long training to young people in nature conservation, which sounds fantastic. However, this, co this program only took in a cohort of 25 people in 2016, and that's for the whole year. And I've been unable to find out if, if, if the program is still in existence. So clearly this program is a small scale intensive program which will not meet the need for a long-term broad-based program which reaches large numbers of young people, which is actually what we need. So we are back to civil society. As always in South Africa, we are back to civil society. We've got to do it all, I'm afraid. Um, it seems that it is up to, it is up to mountain clubs hiking organizations, indeed any organization with an interest in introducing youngsters to the outdoors to use their resources as smartly as possible, to reach as many people as possible from a, a diverse, as diverse a pool as possible. Organizations um, as, as, as the ones that I've dealt with here, as well as newer ones such as the Hikers Network, need to work towards the same end. This is a picture, a recent picture of uh, the Hikers Network. I think that, and this is a picture of Ed February, I thought it would be quite inspiring to um, end with a picture of him. I, I think that we need to accept that the rock climbing is an elite sport. Note, not an elitist sport, because we all cannot be rock climbers. Rock climbing cannot be 
um, a mass-based sport. In fact, even ordinary climbing cannot be an, uh, a, a mass-based sport. Since, but since mountain climbers can only emerge from communities which have regular and positive interaction with the mountains, our aim should be to create a large pool of people invested in protecting our mountains. This will not be a quick fix. As lovers and protectors of the mountains are not born, but they are created over time. And they are created through enjoyable and responsible exposure to the mountain environment. Large numbers of people over two generations have been lost to mountain-based recreation as they are now either estranged from, estranged from the mountain environment, indifferent to it, or simply unaware of its splendors and the potential that mountains offer for enjoyment. What is needed, therefore, is to recreate the positive levels of interaction with the mountain that existed to a large extent prior to the 1970s, and to extend that through all, throughout all the communities of Cape Town. Given our history, our ultimate aim should be to grow a support base for mountaineering and the natural environment that is both youthful and diverse. This is the only way to create a sustainable future for both mountaineering and mountain conservation in Cape Town. These are the final thoughts that I would like to leave with you today. Thank you so much for your attention over the course of these two lectures. And if you have any comments or questions, I'd be happy to take them now. No, no, 2009, it started then. Uh, I, I possibly didn't read that out. It, it started with a junior, um, honorary junior ranger program in 2009, but I gave you the statistics for the latest one that I could find, which was 2016. So I, I'd like to know whether it's still in existence now, because you know, even if it is such a small number, it's at least better than nothing. And it's an excellent and very intensive environmental education program. It's just, you know, we need more than such a tiny program. You know? I was on the very first Wuri Kwapa Trail in the past okay. and yes. the people they were training, yeah. and it was very special. So I can imagine. Now the Wuri Kwapa Trail, I don't know if it's still in, is in operation. Yeah. So, you know, what has happened there? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. No problem. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, no, I, I, I take that criticism. The problem is that I had to distill um, several years of research into two hours, and I left out a lot of information. I have actually started um, on, 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 that, on that work. It requires a lot of interviews, I'm afraid, and so it's going to be an ongoing um, process. Um, I have gleaned some information from the the Mountain Club of South Africa, they do have um, black climbers there. And in the UCT MSC in the 90s, there are also uh, black climbers, uh, sp specifically female Muslim climbers in, in the UCT MSC. So it's going to be my joyful task to go back to my research and conduct those interviews. And hopefully, maybe next year, I'll be able to um, write that role. Thank you. Yeah, is this a tradition of hunting at the East Spanning Colleges in okay. Cape Town? Because recently, Jordan uh, Sally Davis and Chris Hewitt, that I, that I was part of, uh, 
Which which year is with us? Thanks very much for that. I'm going to get back to you just to get some more detailed information. Uh, just to get back to um, that lady's question about uh, women, um, I have actually conducted some interviews, uh, for example, with um, CPMC members like Linda Fortune, and the impression of, uh, she she was not a, um, a leading rock climber. Um, she was a rock climber, but she described herself as not a leading rock climber. And the impression I got from her, plus the other people that I interviewed, is you know, they hadn't put forward any leading, any names of leading female rock climbers. So if you do have any other information for me, that would be fantastic, then I could interview them. Um, Colleen Knipe was another person that I, I, I came across. I've interviewed her once. I've tried to interview her again just to get a, a, a bigger, you know, a better picture of her rock climbing career, but Unfortunately, I've not been able, I've not been successful. Um, and then the, I, I see the WPMC members are here, so I don't know if they could possibly speak to um, leading women climbers in their club. Uh, but just before they do so, um, the Hikers Network, which is this newer organization that has a rock climbing element, I know for a fact that they have leading women climbers, and it is in fact my intention to interview them as well. Thank you. Stephen, I don't know if you have any information for us from WPMC. Very true. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 You're right. And I think something else which I haven't mentioned is the the swing among the youth towards passive recreation. You know, lots of kids would rather be busy on their phones and rather than get out into the mountain. They regard it as nagging when you say, go into the outdoors, get some fresh air, you know, all this old fuddy-duddy stuff. So, yeah, there are a whole host of reasons besides those which I have enunciated. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Um, that doesn't 
takes everybody. Um, yeah. I certainly when I did it at the University of the UK and haven't been in Cape Town very long, um, you used to just walk with a brother over your shoulder.